I spent several years in youth ministry before I uh, grew up and became a real pastor, so to speak. I, and I have found out that you're always doing youth ministry. Uh, sometimes it's with, you know, the, the wee little ones, and as they grow up, you know, and sometimes they exceed the height of their parents. <clears throat> and, uh, and then, uh, but then there's, there's times when you, you find someone who is, a, who is a kid at heart, too. And, oh, boy, that, that sometimes brings some interesting things in, in the ministry. One of the things back decades ago now, when I was in youth ministry, uh, was this age-old question of helping the junior high school student understand, who am I anyway? Uh, boy, the, this whole idea of trying to figure out who we are, it, it's something that uh, sometimes bugs people their, their whole lives. And let me tell you, the kids in junior high that, that got it, they understood uh, who they were, Boy, it was fun to see this many years later some of my peers, those who understood who they were. Man, God has really grabbed a hold of them and taken them to some really neat places, and, and He has really blessed their lives. For those who really struggled with trying to figure out who they were, Sadly, I can think of four out of my high school graduating class of 841. I can think of four that didn't even make it through high school. They died before, before they graduated. I, I think of others when uh, uh, there's the... If you're on Facebook, you know that there are groups out there, and I, I found the Upper Darby High School class of 19... Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and uh, boy, I, I, I'm reconnected with some folks that uh, really didn't get it when they were in junior high and high school, but boy, uh, they came to know the Lord, and it was really fun to see how the Lord has shaped their lives. And then I read of others who are, who are still struggling. This whole thing about understanding who we are is, is something that, again, some struggle their whole, with their whole lives. Look how it's being played out today. Uh, last Sunday night, um, some of us were at a, at a hymn sing uh, over at Plymouth Church. Multiple churches got together from miles around. I had a chance to speak. I, I squeezed my 10 minutes into 12, uh, and uh, they didn't have to come with a hook and grab me off the platform. But anyway, I, I talked with a couple of retired teachers after, after the service that, I, that I've known for many years. And, uh, you know, they, uh, the conversation went around to how difficult it is in the educational setting, especially in the public schools these days. And some of the things that Jan has been facing is just, uh, it would, a, a seasoned veteran teacher that I was talking with who had been retired for only a few years, maybe four or five years, uh, she said, I... You know, from the feedback you get from Mary Margaret and others who are working in the schools, are they really putting litter boxes in bathrooms? I said, yes, they are. Because you see this identification thing, this who I am thing, and I've mentioned this before, that there's this new identity called furries. So if you identify as a cat or a dog or any kind of thing you want, we're going to lay out the red carpet and we're going to accommodate you. Wow. Wow. The response I got from one of these teachers, boy, I'm glad I got out when I did. Pray for our teachers. There are a number of believing teachers and other support staff in, in our public schools. Pray for them. Pray for them as you've never prayed for them before because there is an opportunity to shine light in a very dark place. So this, this whole thing about who am I, yeah, it, it has ramifications from when we were wondering who we are. Maybe sometimes we're still wondering who we are. Um, but look how it is being addressed toward the youngest and most vulnerable and most shapeable in our society today. That's why this is so important that we take a look at Moses' encounter with God. Uh, we're picking up where we left off last week. Uh, Moses was out tending the flocks and, and he saw this burning bush and he went over and he was told to take his shoes off, set a spell, 
because God wanted to uh, have a few words uh, with him. Um, God said that, you know, I'm sending you to, um, to Pharaoh, to the leader of Egypt, and I'm going to use you to tell him to let my people go. God sent him with a task because God uh, really uh, had seen the suffering of his people there in Egypt. We're going to pick up where we left off last time with verse 11. Now, Exodus chapter 3, verse 11. If you're not there already, let's go there. And uh, Moses is facing that same question. God told him to go to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. What does Moses say? Who am I? Look at his question. See, Moses wasn't quite sure about who he was. But look how he phrases this. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring out the Israelites from Egypt? And so uh, he has this question that uh, is framed very, very interestingly. Now, we could parse this out all kinds of ways. Uh, one way might be, who, me? Uh, <laughs> wait a minute, you're, you're asking me to do this? You know, isn't it is interesting that, um, that there's a difference between being a volunteer and being voluntold? <laughs> yeah, so um, there are times when we see a need the, the need is projected, the need is, is made known, and yeah, that's something I can identify. That's something I really have a burden for. That's something I'd like to do. I'll volunteer, and I'll, I'll help with that. Then it's an interesting, once you get involved in some of these volunteer organizations, that uh, the way sometimes things work is that uh, you're voluntold. <laughs> hey, you know, you, you've done real well with this. Would you like to do that? Uh, I, I'm, I may have been guilty of doing that a few times over the course of ministry. We try to do it in line with people's spiritual gifts and their call and, 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 and all kinds of things. I'm not going to get into that. But Moses' question, you could take it that way. Was he being voluntold by God about what he was going to do? Maybe. There's another way to look at it, too. When Moses questions, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? and bring the Israelites out of Egypt, there may be an aspect of, of what here? Feelings of inadequacy? Oh, I think we've been there before. When God leads us to do something, when God tells us to do something, when God has uh, identified something in our lives that matches with something that he wants to do in accomplishment of his will, Oh, sometimes we feel inadequate. Sometimes we're saying, oh, oh, wait a minute, Lord. I, I, no, you want me to get up there and you want me to talk? That was me. That was, that was me. No, or Lord, you, you want me to go over to this, this land that I've never been to before and you want me to, to swing a hammer or even talk? to people about Jesus? Oh, wait a minute, please don't send me to Africa where the natives are restless at night. You might have seen that musical years ago. Yeah. So be between uh, our ideas of our own feelings of inadequacy and the, the hardness of being kind of voluntold to do something by God, can you identify with Moses' question now, who am I? As the disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, we know a little more who we are. We're a disciple of Jesus Christ who happens to be uh, filling your occupation. That's what it ought to be. What was God's answer? Let's take a look at verse 12. God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. Well, first of all, we'll look at this first answer of God's. I will be with you. Wow. Now, 
when someone asks us to do something, and it might be a little bit out of our comfort zone, what's the first thing that comes out of the asker's mouth? Well, you know, you're good at this, you're good at that, I see this in you, I see that in you. It's, it's all about the other person, isn't it? But God's answer to Moses was what? A promise of his presence. I will be with you. I will be with you. I will take every step of this journey that I'm calling you to do, I'm going to take it with you. I'm going to be right there. God's presence will be so clear to Moses that that wipes away the, the who am I. Wow. What a reassurance. What a, what a blessed assurance that Moses would have God's presence with him. Second thing is a sign that God said he would give. This, this will be the sign. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, so that's the exodus, that's the, the rest of this whole book of, of God's holy word, all of the plagues, all of the things that God would bring his people through, all of the challenges to Pharaoh, all of Pharaoh saying, no, I will not let God's people go. That got accomplished. The sea parted. The people of Israel went through on dry land. The staff was used. And Pharaoh and his chariots and his armies got swallowed up. Or the, the armies, not Pharaoh. But then what? Then you will worship God on this mountain. Remember, Moses was on the mountain of God. And I'm going to use you to bring my people out, and you're going to worship me right on this holy ground where your feet are planted right now. Wow. So look at this answer that God has to Moses' first question. Who am I? I am the God who is speaking uh, to you from this burning bush. Listen, because I can keep my promises. Who are you? You are one that I have right here in my hand. I will be with you, and you will worship me once you've accomplished what I have for you to do. Wow. Who am I? If we, are, if we are in a personal relationship with God, we have those two things that we can count on. His presence and his promise and his praise coming out of our mouths. Yeah. Moses had another question. He was just full of questions this day. He says, okay, look at verse 13. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? Moses is thinking, okay, I'm, I'm going to get him here. Uh, you know, give me a little more, give me a little more information here. Um, you've identified yourself to me, but what's your name? Now, the older I get, I'm sure nobody here can identify with this, but the older I get, the, the fewer names I'm remembering from, you know, 15, 20, 25, 30 years. It, it happened with my friends in McMullins. Uh, we've met over the years. We're acquainted from whatever. But, you know, I, I could not put a name with a face. So thank you for being gracious to all three of you, so appreciate that. Um, Moses asks, what is your name? There, there's the question right there. Um, okay, Look at his negotiating tactic here. Suppose I do go and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. They ask me, what's your name? What, what do I tell them? Well, God has an answer for that, and he answers it in a very important way. He says, I am who I am. 
I am who I am. I, I will spare you all of the, the, uh, the Hebrew interpretation here. Not all of it, some of it. God is who he is. Well, let's put it in the third person. But let's put it in the future, too. Because there are some theologians who, and you might even see it in the margin, in, in your translation of, of God's word. I will be who I will be. Oh. Let's put it this way. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, isn't he? He is. I am who I am. Now, we can dig into all, all kinds of theology to understand who God is. God is eternal. We know that for sure. I am who I am. I continue to be who I am. I always was. I always will be. I am who I am. He is the one who exists of his own will. He exists because he is. And when we are created in God's image, that aspect of the eternal of God, yeah, that becomes more real to us when we understand that if we're created in God's image, that means that we have eternity. Our soul will live on. And if we know Jesus as our Savior, yes, our eternity will be spent in heaven with God. These bodies are perishing, and they will perish someday. But praise God, we have a home in heaven, and our soul lives on. Now, the Greek philosophers, they, they, they tried to understand this. One of them uh, spoke of God as the unmoved mover. They understood that there was this, this, this power out there that uh, made everything and makes everything work, but... We can't figure out what started him, so we call him the unmoved mover. It's another way of saying God is who he is. He is, period. That's it. That's who God is. I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. I am. Okay, so sometimes when we see this word I am uh, or Yahweh in other places in the New Testament, uh, Old Testament rather, we see the words Lord, L-O-R-D, and they're all capital letters. You know, the big L and then a little smaller font, O-R-D. That is this word here, Yahweh, the God who saves, the God who knows, the God who is from all eternity, past, present, and future. I am has sent me to you. Now that's going to mean something to this group of folks that Moses is going to go see, and we're going to see that right now. Moses is done asking questions at this point when we get to verse 15. Moses, I mean, God also said to Moses, oh, here we go. Isn't it interesting that uh, Moses was speechless after God identified his name? Jehovah, Lord, God, Almighty. Hmm. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, see here we are, there's Lord, all caps, the God of your fathers, now look at this, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. By this point, the stories of how God worked among the Israelites from creation through this time of slavery in Egypt had become very clearly passed on from generation to generation to generation to generation. God of Abraham. Well, what's so important about Abraham? God gave a covenant to Abraham. Abraham, you who... You, you think you're childless? You try to work things out your way? Oh, wait, I got, I got a plan for you. 
Look at the look at the seashore, Abraham. Look at the stars. That's what your offspring. That's what your legacy is going to be. That's that's your genealogy. I, I got that down. God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac. Well, Isaac was that son of promise, wasn't he? He was that son of the covenant. Isaac was that one that uh, God was ready to test Abraham's faithfulness. Isaac was on that altar. And as soon as Abraham obediently raised that dagger to sacrifice Isaac, at God's instruction, the ram was caught in the thicket. And they worshiped God on the mountain, didn't they? Oh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob. Well, what's so important about Jacob? Jacob was the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. All of the 12 tribes of Israel go back to Jacob. The God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he has sent me to you. Oh, okay. That's going to give him instant credibility in the eyes and the ears of the elders of Israel who are trying desperately to get their people through this period of slavery. Wow. That gave Moses credibility. God says, who I am? Here, here's who I am. I am the God of your fathers. And look at this. God also has an eternal and generational name. Look at the end of verse 15. This is my name forever. The name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Wow. Yeah. That's why we call the Lord the Lord. He is the master. He is the boss. God's eternal name. That's why the Israelites held it in such high regard. That's why the God uh, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, known as Jehovah or Yahweh, that's his eternal name. And they had great reverence for that, those who knew him. And this is the name passed on from generation to generation. God has a lot of names. But this is the eternal and generational name. What about verse 16? What do we see here? Go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, just for reinforcement, God repeats himself here, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you. Okay, well, let's stop there just a minute. Here's Moses coming off the mountain, leaving, leaving some of the sheep behind, taking his wife and his kids, and they saddle up and they, they, they go back to Egypt. And he gets a hold of all the, the elders of Israel and they, 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 have a, they have a church board meeting. Oh, no, no, they, they have a meeting. They have an assembly time together. And Moses identifies who he is and he identifies the one who sent him and he uses these key words that these elders of Israel will remember and, and oh, they're going to listen up. I am watching over you. Huh? I'm watching over you. I've watched over you. Yeah, I mean, you know that Pharaoh's underlings have made it harder and harder and harder for us to make bricks so he can build whatever he wants to build. And they've limited our rations. They, we're, we're slaves. And, and, and you're here to tell me that God is watching over us? <laughs> That's a good one. I can imagine just from human nature that some of the elders of Israel might have thought about that at least once. I've, I've watched over you. I've watched over you. I've seen what's been done to you in Egypt. Remember why they went to Egypt in the first place, right? There was a famine in the land. All of Abraham's sons 
went. But who did God send ahead? Joseph. Remember? Joseph was daddy's favorite. And they sold him into slavery in Egypt. And who did Joseph become? He became next in line to Pharaoh. Oh. And God took care of his people Israel when they went to Egypt. But then, well, after a time when Joseph and others kind of didn't do what was right in the eyes of Pharaoh, one of the Pharaohs at least, oh, they, they forgot about God. And, oh, hey, look at this numerous people here. They're, they are multiplying, and someday they're going to be more than us. Let's make them slaves. <laughs> That'll take care of them. And God continued to bless them. And that's what we found out last Sunday. God continued to bless. God became very aware and very careful to see and understand their plight in Egypt. I have watched over you. I've seen what's been done to you in Egypt. But it doesn't end there, does it? We have a verse 17. God makes a promise. I have seen and I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt. Okay, who did he make the promise to? We read it just previously. He made the promise to Moses. And you see, where God reveals his plan and makes his promise, he also has his person to be the one who will work things through. And in this situation, it was, it was Moses. I'm going to bring you up out of your misery into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hibbites, and the Jebusites, all the sites, all the ites. That's a good land. That's a land flowing with milk and honey. Oh, doesn't that sound good, milk and honey? When you've been making bricks in the hot sun all day long, under slavery, under the yoke, being whipped and mistreated. Yeah. God has a promise. I'm going to bring you up. We got a land for you. And this is a land of promise. God makes a promise. And that's a promise that they're going to remember. Especially when they're out in the wilderness for 40 years. Wandering. Hey, hey, Mo, Mo's, Moshi, uh, what's your name? Boss man. Didn't God say, and didn't you tell us that God said he was going to take us up into a land of milk and honey? What's with this manna? You know, the manna that God provided. When they got tired of the manna and complained to God about it, what he said, he sent quail up to their up above their ankles worth of quail. God took care of his people, even those who rebelled against him, even as he was fulfilling his promise to bring people out of Israel. Out of Egypt, rather. He took care of Israel. So, what does this mean for us today? When we ask the question, who am I? Who am I? Do, do we know who we are? Or are we stuck back in junior high or high school? We haven't figured out who we are yet. I've got good news for you. If you know Jesus as your Savior, you are his. You have a name written down in heaven. And someday, you will spend all of eternity with him. So for now, you can be like my friend in Philadelphia who gets up every time he shares his testimony and says, hey, my name is Joe, I'm a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I happen to be a mailman. Because most of the time, what do we do? When people ask us who we are and what we do, it's our occupation. Our identity has become wrapped up and what we do to earn a paycheck. So catch me and correct me if I say, if, some, if you're around me and someone asks me uh, who I am, what I do, 
catch me, and you're free to correct me. I'm on record here. Uh, if I don't say I'm a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ who happens to be a pastor, correct me. First, I'm a disciple of Jesus. First, I am his. I know him personally. He has called me by name. What's your identity? Is your identity found in Christ and in Christ alone? See, that's where the rubber meets the road. How does that help us? Well, Moses, what was his question to God? <laughs> I, I don't feel like I'm being volunteered here. I'm being voluntold. Who am I that you're going to send me to Pharaoh to bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I to do that? You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. If you find your identity not in your inadequacies, but in Christ, God takes care of those inadequacies, doesn't he? Who am I? What's your identity? If you find your identity in Christ, that takes precedence. That takes precedence. How else can we apply this to today? If we ask God, like Moses did, what's your name? What is your understanding of who God is? What's your understanding of that? Now, I have preached a whole series of messages over the years, year, years ago, on the names of God. There are oodles of names of God. And they always have to do with what? His character which dictates his action in our lives. Some of you know God as your healer. Some of you know God as a strong and powerful and mighty God. His strong arm takes you through an awful lot. You see his strength worked out. Sometimes we see God as our provider. All kinds of names for God. What is your understanding of who God is? Sometimes one of those other names of God will kind of come to the forefront. But never let go of the fact that God has shown you and shown us his very most personal name. I am who I am. How do you understand that? And how do you see that played out as he acts according to his other names when god says this is who i am how do we put that to work look at the power of what i call three generation depth three generation depth what, what, what do i mean by that well god said to moses they, they want to know who sent you the god of your fathers abraham isaac jacob how many generations is that Three, what about when Paul wrote to Timothy? Hmm, grandma, mom, you. There is strength and power in three-generation depth. I look at those in my family who have walked with the Lord. My grandmother, my paternal grandmother, my father, me, and I see another generation or maybe two coming forward. That's where strength comes spiritually in a family when you have three generation depth that comes through Scripture time and time and time again. There's power there in three generation depth. We need to pray toward that three generation depth of spiritual understanding. There's power there. People who know God personally through three generations. We need to understand and apply these names of God that we talked about in this previous point. Understand them and apply them. I don't often say do a Google search, but do a Google search on the names of God. And, but, but make sure you're looking at a trustworthy site. Otherwise, I've got books that I can lend you or point you toward. But understand and apply the names of God. Next, what about God's watch care? We share God sightings. God is watching over us. 
no matter what we might think from our perspective, how could a loving God do this? No, no, see it. God could take us out with one fell swoop. Look where culture is taking us. And he will someday. He'll make things right with him, period. But until then, see and proclaim God's watch care. He is watching over us. He always watches over us. He does not slumber. He does not sleep. Oh, that came up in the last couple of weeks too, didn't it? Yeah. And then finally, see and proclaim God's promises. Those of you who love books, do you remember, oh, probably 20 plus years ago, the Jesus Person Promise book? It's a little book about that big. And all it is, it's filled with the promises from God's Word. Chapter and verse and the verse written out. All the promises of God's Word. It's just, just a little book about that big. Pretty small print. Yeah. Search out God's Word for His promises. See them, but then proclaim them. Proclaim God's promises. Proclaim His watch care. Know who he is. And work toward three generation plus depth. Father, thank you that you have shown us who you are. Thank you, Father, that you have drawn us to you. You've drawn us to this place today. And not just these four walls, but this place where we're at in our lives today. We have an understanding of who you are. We have an understanding of what you've done for us. Lord, help us to know you and help us to live for you today. Help us to know who we are in Christ. And Lord, help us to stand against anything that would second guess or question or, or threaten that. Help us to see who you are. Help us to see your care and help us to proclaim your name to the nations that are in an uproar, that are in an uprising. Help us, Lord, to bear good fruit that people would want to see and partake of the same fruit and the same vine that we're connected to, that they can bear good fruit too. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. We ask your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen.